uh, I think I'll start with that and then turn it over to my finance colleagues. But I, I'll say no, I don't think that there is support for that. Not even, uh, you know, on the other in the other body, not even uh, Representative Wilson has said that on an uh, Alaska Public Radio Network interview. She talked about that level of cuts would be devastating to the state, drive us deeper into recession. I don't think anyone realistically believes that the governor intends the budget to be $3.2 billion. The governor's chief of staff himself at the Unitarian Church in Anchorage, which I attended, I went there to see his speech, said that that was the starting point for the budget. He expected the House and the Senate to come up with additional ideas to put on the table and the revenue to support those ideas. So I'm going to take them at their word. Senators uh, Olson or Senator Wilkowski, any thoughts on that? So um, I think the public would not support um, the level of those cuts. And I, and I think constitutionally you have some problems. And I think for the sake of our economy, it would uh, very likely put us into a severe recession to have that m magnitude of cuts. And just to give you a few examples. So education, we have a constitutional obligation to provide for education funds. That is $1.2, $1.3 billion of funding right now. Um, you, if you have a significant amount of cuts there, uh, not only will the public be outraged, not only will our children suffer, but you'll probably face a, a constitutional um, fight in the Supreme Court, which you'll lose. Um, in, in Hess, as uh, Senator um, Keel mentioned, uh, you, you, you have to look at our justice system as a holistic system. In fact, I had a meeting yesterday with the Commissioner of Public Safety designee, and one of the things that she emphasized was uh, behavioral health, uh, mental health, uh, substance abuse, abuse issues. Uh, you, it's important to remember that 90% of all of our crimes in, this state of, in the state of Alaska are drug and alcohol related, drug or alcohol related. 45% of all the people in the correction system are mental health beneficiaries. If you start cutting uh, huge amounts of money from the health uh, and social services systems, you are going to cause crime rates to skyrocket. Uh, and that is a public safety problem. If we, the, we have 11 departments in the state of Alaska that comprise about $580 million of our budget. You start cutting those departments, uh, you could cut all those departments, and you still have a significant budget deficit. You could, cut, you could fire every employee in the state of Alaska, and you'd still have a budget deficit. Uh, you just simply, uh, I believe cannot get there by cutting your way out of this. And I think uh, most people in this building recognize that, and most Alaskans recognize that. Anybody else want to add anything? To Thank you, James. Next question. And please identify yourself in the publication you work with. Aaron McGordy. Aaron McGordy, uh, Fairbanks Daily News Miner. As a member of the Resource Committee, uh, this question is directed at Senator Kawasaki. Um, it looks like the Dunleavy administration is taking a somewhat cautious approach to oil forecasting setting, and at least in their preliminary budget, the price per barrel at 64. Moving forward, um, how safe do you think it is for Alaska to rely on oil like it has in the past? And um, what would you change about our approach to the oil industry? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have served on the Resources Committee a number of years in the House. You know, the ANS crude um, is priced at sixty dollars and eighty-eight cents right now. Um, it's fluctuated from, I think it was up in the high seventies just before the election, and gone down to as low as, as fifty. I think betting on oil all the time uh, is a is um, it's a gamble. <laughs> I mean, simply put, and relying on uh, on that uh, is um, is problematic for folks that are on the finance committee trying to figure out how to balance the needs of education and health and social services um, uh, with the funds that, that we rely on uh, every day. Um, you know, on, uh, on top of that, I just wanted to point out that the permanent fund also has lost uh, nearly $5 billion in the last couple months, um, and that's due to the stock market. Uh, so to rely simply on, on oil and gas, um, I think, is going to be a real challenge. Uh, but I will say this, uh, we've seen projections going off into 10 years that oil production continues to decline um, and that we are losing between a billion and a billion and a half dollars every year from this per barrel credit. Um, that, that really needs to be looked at and reviewed this year um, because, uh, you know, we're facing, again, a $1.6 billion budget deficit uh, under current, uh, under what the governor's introduced. Um, I hope that we take a legitimate look at it 
and I hope that the members of both the House and the Senate really look at, uh, at that in the future. And I will say this, um, you know, although the new, the fourth quarter reports aren't quite out, um, you know, ConocoPhillips to date has made a $1.4 billion in profit, um, probably another $500 million coming in the last three months. So it's, uh, um, they are profitable corporations. Um, and when I see folks that are in my district that are just trying to heat their homes, uh, families that are just trying to put their kids in good schools and make sure that they have basic necessities, um, that, is, that is one place that we need to look. Appreciate that. Next question. James Brooks from the Anchorage Daily News. And then um, what are your views on the Senate Bill 26 rules that were passed last year, the POMV rules? Do you believe that the legislature should abide by those this year? Anybody want to try that first? Sir? Um, sure. <clears throat> so I think, I, think, uh, it's, I think it's a good idea to have some parameters on the amount that we draw from the permanent fund. I also think you have to recognize that there were unpaid amounts in 2016, 2017, 2018, which many of us believe should be paid back. But, but I, I think it's a good idea to have parameters on how much is drawn from the earnings reserve, absolutely. Senate Bill 26 set uh, a rate at five and a quarter percent for the first three years, dropping down to 5% after that. Some people think that's a little on the high end. The projected rates of return for the permanent fund are around 6.7, 6.9% for the next decade though. So we should be able to sustain it and we should be able to actually grow the permanent fund uh, with that extra percent and a half that we're gaining, uh, we're projected to gain. Just to follow up briefly, um, Senator, how do you reconcile that view with your support for paying those back dividends? Because I think the, there were unpaid amounts that were due to Alaskans. In 2016, I, we've had a statute on the books since 1982. It's a statute that uh, the people of Alaska came together, debated for years, and said, we want, this is how we want to share our resource wealth. It, it was at a time when uh, the legislature back in the 80s talked a lot about this. There were special interest groups that would come in and take um, an enormous amount of the wealth that our oil produced. And there was a feeling that it was just an unfair system. And uh, the legislature back then, the people of Alaska came together and overwhelmingly said, we want to come up with a system that fairly distributes that our resource wealth, come up with the permanent fund dividend program. It was a program that I felt very, in my constituents, I now felt very strongly about. Uh, it, ha it has a provision in there that it shall be paid, it, the money shall be transferred, it wasn't followed. Uh, so, so from my perspective is, uh, that was money that was owed back in 2016, it was owed in 2017, it was owed in 2018. I, I sort of removed that from the five, and, and I know where you got, and I, I, but I sort of removed that from the five and a quarter percent draw because that's, <coughs> that's money that you owe. And I, I understand that if you pay that back to the people, you're going to exceed that. But that is money that was owed to the people of Alaska and should be paid back. I want to just add one thing to James that you know the the uh, the principle of the fund is sacrosanct. You know you can't just jump into the principle of the fund. It's constitutionally protected. We're talking about the earnings here. Number one, number two. That's why you see us having various proposals for for ensuring that we actually are inflation-proofing the fund. And number three, in response really to the question that came from the news miner as well, if you're going to build long-term sustainability for this budget, you're going to have to do it from a renewable resource, not just the non-renewable resource of oil and gas. And the permanent fund was designed to be that renewable resource in the long run. So managing it appropriately, ensuring that you don't spend it down at a level that is un unsustainable is, is critical. So how we get there? It's going to be a debate between all three of our, both of our bodies, the legislative bodies, and with the governor. But we have to come up with a process that does that because that's one part of how we build a sustainable future for the state. Uh, Shanna, you had the next question. Shanna Crandall, Alaska Education Update. Um, I don't know if anyone can address uh, any anything they see happening with education uh, funding uh, programs at the Department of Education. Uh, I know Senate Bill 6 so far is the only education-related bill that's in, been introduced. Does anyone see anything else on the horizon being addressed? Any other issues or funding or programs? Uh, I'll start by just saying Senator Kawasaki and I uh, both have pursued pre-K in his House career and my Senate career, and we've uh, linked together to, to, to co-author that bill, Senate Bill 6, that you're describing, which you 
create uh, universal voluntary early education for the state of Alaska that's culturally appropriate and evidence-based. So thank you for giving a shout out for that. It is the only bill in education, so I hope it'll get a hearing and pass out of the Senate relatively early. That said, the Moore suit was quite clear that there's a certain level constitutionally that the state is obligated to, to provide, the level of support that the state is obligated to provide. On the record over the last two years, it's made, been made clear, not just in terms of debate in the Senate, but in testimony before the education committees in the House and the Senate, that the department believes that they're at the edge of not being able to provide the level of support they need to provide to meet their constitutional obligation. That means absolutely there should be no further cuts to education. And in fact, we probably need to be adding to education. That's what that means. And when Senator Wilikowski says that it's inviting a potential constitutional lawsuit, he is in fact correct. That if we do not continue to support education, the House came together to do that last year, the Senate came together to do that last year, collectively supported forward funding, supported increases to the education budget to not continue those obligations would be a dereliction of constitutional duty. And I, I certainly hope that the governor doesn't go down that road. Anybody want to add anything to that? Hope that answers your question. Kevin Baird, Juno Empire. Uh, this question is for Senator Keel. Uh, you mentioned that uh, cutting social services would be a fast ticket to increasing crime. Are there any social services you feel must be bolstered uh, within the state to prevent more crime from happening. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you know, as, as we alluded to earlier, I think that uh, mental health treatment across our state uh, is, is on, on the lagging edge of adequate. Uh, in many places, uh, it, it barely exists at all. Uh, I also think that the addiction treatment and the addiction services that are, that are out there um, are, are pretty far behind the need. It's, it's going to be important that uh, we make sure Alaskans have access to health care, both physical health and mental health. And without that mental health component, uh, you will see, I'm, uh, I'm sure, a lot of folks who, who can make it today, not able to make it tomorrow. And, and that doesn't just impact them and their families. When folks get into terrible trouble, it, it ends up impacting their neighbors and their communities. Um, the same is true of addiction. Uh, and and I, I want to be careful. I spoke earlier of addiction in terms of the criminal justice system. There are a lot of Alaskans who struggle with addiction who are not in the criminal justice system. And we need to make sure that the resources they have available to stay out of that kind of trouble remain strong even as we make sure that folks who are committing crimes, driven by addiction, at least initially, um, have both the services available and the consequences needed to push them into that treatment. Uh, the door's got to be open. Some folks need uh, <clears throat> a firm hand getting through it, but it needs to be open to everybody. Thank you, Senator Kill. I really appreciate your comments, and that's one of the reasons why I spoke about maintaining Medicare it's really important because our community not only have physical issues, but they also have mental issues. Thank you. Andrew Kitchman. Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Media and KTOO. Um, this is for Senator Wilikowski. Um, understanding that you see the, two, the uh, payback as being owed Alaskans, the $2 billion reduction in the permanent fund would lead to about $100 million a year in less money available for the 5% draw. So um, do you have a $100 million of cuts in mind to pay for that? And, and the oil ta uh, tax credit you're, change you're proposing, um, you've, I think you've estimated as $1 billion to $1.5 billion, but the current deficit's 1.6. Right, so just to address, um, the oil tax credit um, bill that I filed, it's Senate Bill 14. Uh, this year we will um, allow the oil industry to deduct $1.24 billion in tax credits. Uh, I think that's um, something that needs to be looked at. It's something that I think has needed to be looked at for years. It's 
uh, over a billion dollars for the next decade per year. Uh, this is a significant amount. Um, so so I, I do think that's you know, certainly one thing that can address a huge amount. As far as the paying back the permanent fund dividend checks, um, I guess you could, I, I would sort of flip it around and say that the state has benefited from having that additional money for the last three years and has accrued uh, capital gains and interest and income. And um, that's those additional benefits are not are not going. Those are hundreds of millions of dollars, I would estimate. Uh, the state is getting to keep those additional benefits. That they're not going back to the people of Alaska. They'll sit in there. They'll continue to grow. Uh, as far as other cuts, um, I look forward to the governor's budget. I, you know, he ran on a platform of protecting education and protecting public safety and uh, paying back a full dividend and. Um, and seemingly no significant impacts to the people of Alaska. So, so I'm, I'm looking forward to his budget coming out and, and seeing how this is going to happen. It's, it, the amendments will be due in the next couple of weeks, and uh, if there are efficiencies there, I, I certainly look for those. We're uh, at the end of time right now. We'll take, I think I'll take one last question. I know that Noah doesn't want me to, but I'm going to take one <laughs> last question because I see that, our, our, uh, that John from KT... You, you ask a question. Uh, so, Sean McGuire, uh, KTU, you. Uh, my question's regarding what's left of Senate Bill 91. Um, there was campaigning on trying to repeal some of that legislation. What is the Senate minority's stance on that, and what are some of the legal legal things that could, changes in law that could be made to increase public safety? Uh, there's a couple of uh, short uh, response to that. I think I'll also turn this over to Senator Keel in a minute. But no, I would start by saying the Senate, last uh, Senate in the House last year and the year before, really f thoughtfully looked at the um, areas of Senate 91 that needed to be fixed and repaired, which included you know, release on your own recognizance, uh, how we were dealing with certain sea felonies, those kinds of things. And I think we've generally fixed many of those. You'll note that in recent data that the Anchorage Police Department released those rates of crime, car theft, those kinds of things have been falling rather dramatically as they've also upped their police force. But um, you know, one of the one of the, one of the critical components of that bill were the treatment services provided those re-entering, and those didn't even come online for until the last year. So we're going to be looking at fine tuning and ensuring that the public's safety is maintained by ensuring that we're not weakening some of the more positive changes from Senate Bill 91 in terms of the more serious crimes that had higher penalties for more serious crimes, but at the same time looking for any other remaining loopholes that need to be corrected. And we'll be, you know, everyone sees criminal justice as a priority. I don't know if Senator Keel, you want to add anything to that? Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say again, it's, it's really important that um, we, we work on this with our eyes open and that we not, not get into the bumper stickers. Senator Begich alluded, if, if you just repeal SB 91, well, you've, you'd lower penalties for some of the worst violent crimes. I, I don't think anybody's really proposing that. Uh, I met with the Attorney General designee this morning. We talked about this issue. Uh, we talked about, you know, how little the state can afford another three, $320 million for a new prison, plus eh, 25, 30 million bucks a year to staff it. Uh, that's not in the budget cards as we're looking to cut tremendous amounts. So we need to keep the smart reforms of criminal justice reform. Over the last two years, the legislature has done a lot to dial back the overreaches. So we need to look at the criminal justice system we have today, think carefully, and act wisely for Alaskans. With that, thank you all for being here. Oh, you're a senator. Senator Baggage, well, I'd like to just go back to one of the questions that uh, James Brooks had brought up about the uh, cuts that are anticipated out there. Both Will Senator Wilikowski and myself are uh, on the Finance Committee, and we are very concerned. And having been on the Finance Committee for almost the last 20 years, when I see $1.5 billion of unallocated cuts, that shows me there's a lack of vision out there. And expecting the legislature to go ahead and come up with those when you have a House that's not even organized right now is beyond what I consider reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Olson. I think that is a fitting place <laughs> to stop this. So thank you very much, folks, and thank you for showing up today. <laughs>